Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, the Apostle Paul says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things as these there is no law. Now, we've been talking about this for eight weeks. This is the eighth week out of a nine-week series. Been looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And, and I think a bunch of you could probably close your Bibles, uh, turn your phones over, whatever you're looking at, and you could probably say it with me. Because that's part of the point. We've been kind of like pounding this in. These are the characteristics that Jesus wants to teach us. And, and so we ought to know what they are so we can identify them. So try it with me without cheating this time, okay? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, today we're talking about gentleness. Ah, how sweet. How nice. How tender. Gentleness. How difficult for the men in the room to listen. I, I, I know that when I just say we're talking about gentleness, because I don't know about every guy in the room here, but gentleness doesn't rate high on the must-have list that I grew up with. And I grew up in a family of all boys, and, uh, you know, my mom was always telling us, you're going to be gentlemen, and she'd try to beat gentleness into us. And uh, don't know how well it worked, but I think most of us guys are, are not really wired naturally for that concept. We're much more wired like the Incredible Hulk. We just want to smash stuff, okay? And, and, and you see, nobody teaches us this. It just kind of comes natural. I got a two-year-old grandson, so I watch him grow up, and he wants to pet the dog, and so we're like, okay, gentle, and, and I watch him. He's like, gentle, once, twice, and then it's like, do, do, do. You know, he just, it's what he does. He just breaks stuff. He just likes to throw things and smash things and laugh about it, and, and then we grow up, and nothing changes, right? Because there's like football. And it's a violent, dangerous sport. And moms go, oh, you want to play football? Oh, no. And guys are like, yeah, oh, yeah. Football. We're going to watch people hurl themselves at one another in team colors so we can cheer on violence and mayhem. And then we love mixed martial arts, MMA, right? And now who came up with this idea? A couple of guys sitting around. Had to be drinking. <laughs> I got an idea. Let's build a cage. Put two guys in there. Make them fight to the death. Oh, that's illegal? Okay, just to consciousness. How's that? Let's just do that. Just beat the other one until one of them's unconscious, then we're done. Uh, I mean, we, you know, and, and what about demolition derbies? I mean, come on, drive fast and smash people with your car. I mean, it's like perfect sport. And, you know, we don't outgrow this. And then, you know, we know that the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness, and it doesn't help that the church has historically mishandled, misinterpreted, misapplied gentleness, which, by the way, can be translated as the same word as meekness. Yeah, that really helps. Uh, so the wrong message has been sent, because a lot of times in church we kind of heard, okay, man, you can follow Jesus so that you can become nice, meek and mild, tame, a pansy, just a sissy, weakling, little girly man. No, no, no. That is not what Jesus called us to be. That is not what gentleness is. See, the, the Holy Spirit is in you if you're a follower of Jesus. And by that I mean you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. And you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then the Holy Spirit is in you, and he is say, saying to you and to me, I'm going to teach you gentleness, biblical gentleness. And so we need to understand what is gentleness. What is gentleness? Because the Holy Spirit's going to teach us if we've got this wrong idea about what gentleness is, we're going to push back against the Holy Spirit. If we understand biblically what gentleness is, I think we're going to embrace it and, and, and go, yeah, I can live with this and I want to learn from this because this is not optional. You know, it's one of the fruit of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit in you is going to teach you this. Uh, Jesus mentioned it in the Beatitudes when he said, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth kind of sounds like a winning deal if we can learn to be gentle. So let me just share a simple definition that I think makes gentleness an incredibly desirable characteristic for everyone. 
Gentleness is strength under control. It's strength under control. The original use of the word was in the context of a wild animal that was domesticated for, for farming use. So an ox that was pulling a plow was gentle because its strength was being used in, a, in an intentional fashion. It wasn't out of control. It was controlled. And, and so uh, it's strength under control. So what I want to do is I want to show you some pictures of gentleness. I want to uh, show you pictures of strength that has been or is demonstrating control because what I'd like to do is replace some of the wrong images that we have of gentle with some biblical images, some, some biblically consistent pictures of what gentleness looks like. So let's start with old school. Horses pulling a wagon. None of us uh, really do this much anymore, but we get the concept that the horses are not weak. Right? Horses, are, are, they, are they weak? No, they're not weak. They're strong animals. And, and they have a lot of power. We know that if you've ever been around horses. And they do that. They're pulling a wagon. So they are being gentle because their strength is being controlled. All right, let's go a little bit more modern. How about this? You like this? Shelby Cobra only has 535 horsepower, 0 to 60 in under 4 seconds. Anybody want to drive one? Yeah. Anybody want to own one? Yeah, we couldn't afford the insurance anyway. Uh, the, uh, but here's the thing. If you know how to drive it, then you can take that power that is in that car and you can control it. If you don't know how to drive it, it's going to end badly. Okay? <laughs> That's just reality. But strength under control. We'll switch gears up and show you something completely different in uh, the mindset, but still just as gentle. You guys recognize this? Hoover Dam. One of the engineering miracles and marvels of the 20th century. And, and what Hoover Dam did was it took the raw power of the Colorado River that, that, that would flood and destroy. And, and it took that power and it focused it so that now it provides drinking water and it provides electricity for a, a large city. See, that, that's gentle. That power is brought under control to benefit others. Now, a lot of you ladies will like this next picture. It's very touching. It's, yeah, a dad with his son or baby. I can't tell. Okay, dad with a, little, a baby. And, and, and what a beautiful sight. And understand this, that it's gentleness because the father has the power to destroy. He could crush that child. He could easily hurt the child, kill the child, and yet he uses his strength to protect, to nurture, to provide, to bless. That's the picture of gentleness. The ultimate picture of gentleness, though, is this. It's Jesus on the cross. Sorry we didn't have an actual photo of Jesus on the cross. So um, Jesus on the cross is a picture of gentleness. It, understand that Jesus himself said, I can call legions of angels to my defense if I wanted to. But he didn't do it. Jesus uh, had the power to torment his tormentors. So uh, here's how I think. Kind of twisted, but go with me on this. There's a storm there while Jesus is on the cross. The sky is black and, and there's thunder and all this kind of stuff. So, so he's hanging there on the cross. He had the power just to direct one of those lightning bolts on those religious leaders' heads, right? Just fry him right there. Oh, sorry, that happened? If you are the Son of God, come, you know. Uh. See me? I just would have had like, you know, you know an ant hill just develop around him and just swallow up a couple of them, you know, just for good measure. But he didn't do that. Do you realize that Jesus stayed on the cross not because he had to? He had the power to come down off the cross. It was not the nails in his hands and his feet that held him there. It was not the Roman soldiers that put him there and kept him there. It was his love for you and for me. You know, they're saying, hey, if you're the Son of God, come down off the cross and we'll believe in you. He could have done it. But he decided to control his power, and instead of using it for himself, he used it for you and for me. Because on that cross, he suffered and died for your sins and my sins so that we could become sons and daughters of God, so that we could have eternal life, so that our sins could be forgiven. And in that moment, he decided that he would use his power to redeem us rather than to save his own life. That is gentleness. That is meekness. It's strength 
that is under control. So let me just say this, especially to the guys in this room, but to all of us, really. Don't let Satan scare you away from the character of Jesus. The world may mock gentleness. It may make fun of meekness because it doesn't understand it. It may define it wrong. But don't let that get in your way of being obedient to Jesus. Go ahead and invite the Holy Spirit to teach you gentleness now that you understand what it is because gentleness is strength under control. And the second thing that I would share with you is please recognize the strength that God has given you. Recognize the strength that you have that God has provided because all of us have strength. All of us have power, if you will. You were made in the image of God and when God made you, He, he gave you, entrusted to you power Power to create, to build, to construct, to bless, and the power to tear down, to ruin, to destroy. So do you realize the strength that God has given you? Now, some of you know that you're strong. You know your strengths. You know that. But some of you are convinced that you are powerless, and no one, absolutely no one is powerless. Think about those, those of you that have little ones, babies. There's so many cute babies around here. But... but Think about those little babies. They cry out, and what happens? That's the only power they have is to cry out, to express their displeasure. And what happens is people come running. Are you hungry? Are you wet? Do you need nurturing? Do you need, be in, do you need to be held? And we do that. The, the baby expresses themselves, and they communicate, and people come. So I want you to clearly see the power that you have, that you possess, that God has given to you. Because you have strength in your abilities and experience. You have strength in your abilities and your experience. See, God made you and he equipped you with abilities. You're made in the image of God and God blessed you with all kinds of talents, things that you're good at. And then if you're a follower of Christ, the moment you confess Jesus, the Holy Spirit came into your life and he gave you gifts. Special gifts that are to be used for the kingdom of God to build it up. So you have these talents, you have these abilities, you've lived life. And so you've got these experiences where God has been, you know, I don't know if you realize this, but all your experiences in life, professional experiences, personal experiences, God has been preparing you for your next job, for your next task. He's been giving you that experience so that you can use it for him and for the kingdom. So you're good at something. What are you good at? Are you, are you good at talking, at teaching, at singing, at playing instruments? Are you good at organizing and recruiting and encouraging and helping? Maybe you're somebody who can build stuff, repair things, create things. Maybe you're somebody who just has the knack to be able to make things beautiful. Maybe you're someone who can plan and organize, put on an event. Maybe you're just a great listener. And people come to you and pour out their heart to you and seek counsel from you. Maybe you're somebody that, that prays for people. And people come to you and ask you to pray for them and, and you want to intercede for them and encourage them that way. Maybe you're somebody that just makes people laugh. You see, all of us have abilities and experiences that have prepared us to be powerful. So can you identify your abilities and can you own them? Do you, do you know the things that you're good at? Do you, can you look at your experiences and see how God ha has equipped you to be able to influence the world, to impact the world with your abilities. And, and a lot of times people kind of go, uh, I don't know what I can do. I really don't understand. So here's the three questions I usually ask them at that point. First is, what are you good at? I know it's not good grammar, but it works. What is it that you're really uh, excellent in? What can you do? Because that's, that's significant. The second question I ask is this, what do you love to do? Because if you love to do something, nobody ever has to motivate you to do it. You're already wanting to do it. You're already invested in doing it. Uh, so no one ever has to try and convince me that I should play golf. <laughs> I, I love to play golf. So, you know, it's not like, oh, come on, Chad, please consider playing. No, okay, I'll show up. Tell me when, where, where you can do it. If I can take time off, I'm going to do it. I'm going to play golf. We're going to do that because I, I already got a passion for it. You got a passion for something. So what, what do you love to do? And then what is your experience? What has God taught you through life? What experiences have you gone through, good and bad, that you've got an insight, an understanding, a knowledge about how the world works and about how God redeems your pain? So you have strength in your abilities and your experience, and you have strength in your resources. 
resource. You ever heard the phrase, money is power? Money is power. If you have financial resources and you have the power to make things happen, you have the power to help people, to bless people, to fund ministries, to build buildings, all these things that impact life change. And so whether you've been entrusted with a little or a lot, God has equipped you with strength of resources. Let me tell you how that's played out in the life of Calvary. Just a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, about 13 years ago, we were sitting around as leaders of Calvary, kind of going, we need to really get out into the community. We need to serve the community. And we didn't have a clue what that looked like. We really didn't know what to do. We were kind of like dumbfounded. What, do, what does that look like? How do we do it? So we had one of our staff members, our youth pastor at the time, who said, hey, there's this ministry called Feed the Hungry. And, and you give them money and they bring a, bunch, a truckload of f- food. It's already in boxes. You distribute it to people. Uh, let's do that. Uh, only it costs a bunch of money. I don't remember the exact amount. Let's say $5,000. It costs $5,000 to get the truck. And we didn't have it in the budget. And we go, well, where's the money going to come from? Well, we think the church will donate support that. But we, we don't know. And, and here's what he said. He goes, I've got the money in my youth ministry budget. I will put my youth ministry budget on the line. And if we don't raise the money, I'll pay the difference. Okay. So we did it. And of course, Calvary responded. And you guys you know, donated. And one day, we raised the money for the truck. And we started off our ministry to the community by handing out a truckload of food. And then somebody was inspired by that. And he goes, hey, I've, I've got this chunk of money. And I want to I use it in some way like that. And so come up with a creative way to, to make a difference in the community. And so that was when we began partnering with Interagency. And, and so we, we spent that money putting homeless people in homes, homeless families in homes. And, and, and it started this whole you know, thing that now Calvary serves our community. We serve our schools. We've got partnerships all throughout the community. Uh, but it was because somebody said, hey, I've got the resources. I'm going to put them towards this. A year ago, I went to Mozambique and I said, hey, you know what, Calvary, let's, let's, we're going to sponsor one well because a well, a freshwater well, will, will impact a thousand people who don't have clean water. A thousand people and they're going to plant a church there and it's going to make a difference. And you guys responded by saying, no, we're going to do one. We ended up sponsoring 12 wells last year. Yeah, isn't that cool? You guys did it. And there, were, and there were individuals and there were families that said, our family wants to do a well or two wells or more. And, and so you guys came alongside. And now, right now, the, the missionaries are just blown away because they're, they're trying to keep up with it as they put in wells that are impacting thousands of people, starting churches. The gospel is going to f- people who've never heard the name of Jesus before. All because people said, I have the strength of these resources that God has given to me to make a difference in the world. Uh, so you have abilities and experience, that's a strength. You have resources as a strength. You have influence as a strength. Influence. Now I know some of you complain, I have no influence, nobody listens to me. Really? Because all of us have influence. It begins, if you're married, you're, you have influence with your spouse. Because you can make their day better or worse. You said it in the vows that you took, and, and you all know you can ruin their day, you can make their day. And, and you have that influence. If you have kids, you have influence with your children. You can bless them or curse them. You can help them or hurt them. You, you know, it's there. That influence is there. You've got family. You've got friends. You've got life group. You've got coworkers. You've got neighbors. Every person that you meet in the course of your day, you have influence with. It, you know, if they come across your path just in passing, you can smile and bless them or you can, you know, curse them. You have influence. Maybe it's a little, maybe it's a lot, but your life influences people in this world more than you know. Some of you are still not convinced, so I'm going to explain to you how it works, how you can see your influence lived out right before your eyes. Because here's what's going to happen. When the service is over, you guys are, a lot of you are going to have this conversation. It may be with one other person. It may be with a group. It may be with your family. You're going to say, where do you want to go eat? Right? Right? And someone's going to ask that question, and somebody's going to be daring enough to say, hey, how about this place? And you're going to go, I don't want to go there. (laughs) And they're going to change the place that they were going to go because you have influence. You have influence. I want you to see that. And and by the way, if you're a a child in this room today, if you're living under your parents' roof, you know, you're a teenager or younger, uh, I want you to understand you guys have influence. You might be sitting here going, I don't have any influence. Nobody listens to me. I just have to do what they tell me. Let me, kids, let me tell you something. I'm going to give you the secret on how you can affect the entire family attitude right now. Okay? You've got way more influence than you realize because you can set the tone for your family. Here's what you do. You go home. 
and, and without saying anything, you just do your homework and do your chores without being told. And, and then when your parents, you know, talk to you, smile, say thank you and please, and they're going to be calling me up saying something is wrong with my kid. I think he's been possessed. Is, is invasion of the body snatchers real? See, kids, the, the way that you respond, I look, whether your parents are great parents or whether they're jerks, I don't know, and, and I'm not saying they can, they can be changed. What I'm saying is your attitude influences how they respond to you. And so if you think that you don't have influence, and, and, and I'll try what I said, and watch the change that happens in your parents. It's amazing what God can do through your influence. You see, none of us are powerless, and, and if we understand the strength that God has given us, and we understand that gentleness is strength that is under control, then finally, I'm going to encourage you to submit your power to God. Submit your power to God. James chapter 4, verse 7, the apostle says, Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now think about that just for a minute. If we submit our strength, our lives to God, even Satan will run away. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. If we try to take on Satan by ourselves, we're going to get whooped. We can't stand up against him. But when we submit our lives to God, then suddenly we become strong. When we take our strength and surrender it to Jesus, then suddenly we have an incredible power in our lives to influence the world. Now, when we talk about our strength, our power, I want you to understand all of us have three basic options of what to do with our power in terms of using our power. So here, first of all, first option of using your power is you can waste it. You can waste it. How do you waste your power? Well, you can deny that you have any power. You can just play the victim and say, I can't do anything. I'm powerless. Uh, that's one way to waste it. The other way to waste it is to just use your power for yourself. In other words, to live your life selfishly. Say, hey, I've got this strength, and I'm going to use it to bless me and my family and my business and my stuff, and I don't care about anybody else. You see, God didn't give you all that strength just for you. And if you use it just for you, then you're going to waste it. Second choice that you have when using your power is to destroy, to tear down, to smash. Whether it's through words or actions, many people use their strength to hurt others. Destroying relationships, destroying families, destroying churches and businesses, and a lot of times destroying their own lives. You ever been around somebody who was bent on self-destruction? It's, it's a terrible thing. And, and here's, the, here's the reality. The influence for self-destruction is always Satan. It's always Satan. Jesus put it this way, John chapter 10, he said, The thief, Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Two options. Self-destructive behavior is always inspired by Satan. Satan wants to destroy you, he wants to destroy your family, he wants to rip apart your life and hurt all the people around you. And so whether it is through addiction or whether it is through uh, you know, eating disorders or whether it is through self-destructive behavior, you know, whether you're cutting or whether you have suicidal thoughts and tendencies, understand the source of that is Satan. He wants to destroy you and he's, he may convince you it's only about you and you're just being self-destructive, it's not going to hurt anybody else. But remember that influence that God gave you, all those other people that care about you in your life, you're hurting them as well. So you can waste your power and influence, you can destroy with it, or you can submit it to God for redemption. God will take our strength and he will redeem with it. In other words, this is choosing to bless people, help people, lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through your abilities, through your experiences, through your resources, through your influence. Whether they're in your family or in your community. And by the way, just to be obvious, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ... You've already made the commitment to submit your power to God. You, you've already made that choice. You said, hey, when you confess Jesus as Lord, you were saying, I submit my power, my life, my abilities, all of it to you, God. It, it's all yours. I'm yours. I'm your servant. So you made that choice. 
Now, here's the thing. It's not just a one and done kind of choice. I mean, yeah, it's a big choice to say I'm a follower of Jesus, to declare it in baptism like we saw this family do today. Uh, what an awesome picture. But the reality is, every day we've got to make the choice to surrender our power to God. To say, God, I want you to control my life. I want you to control my abilities. I want you to control my resources. I want you to control my influence. I want to be a representative of Christ in this world. I want to live a gentle life. So are you living out your commitment to Christ? Are you being gentle? Is your strength under God's control? There's, there's two areas I just want to mention, and, and and if you're not sure, these are the kind of places, I think, that are most revealing about whether or not we're living a gentle life. The first one is this. Are your words gentle? Are your words gentle? Do you bless or curse your spouse? <laughs> most of you are going, ah, a little bit of both. So which one is dominant? Which one is prevalent in your life? Which one is, is most likely to happen? Uh, because, you know, if you can choose to bless, you're going to receive that back. If you curse, if you tear down, you're tearing down yourself. But are you using your power of words to build up your spouse or to tear them down? And what about your kids? Are your words blessing your kids or cursing your kids? Are you building their life up? Are you encouraging them? Are you tearing them down? And, and, and we got to think about these things. Do you ask questions or do you accuse people? Do you make requests or do you make demands? When others are hurting, do you provide comfort or do you provide a lecture? Think about this. When, when your three-year-old burns their hands on the stove, you know, even though you've been telling them, don't touch, it's hot, don't touch, it's hot, and they finally do it, do you, do you sit there and lecture them while they're crying or do you pick them up and run in there and, and put, you know, salve on their hand, bandage it up, do whatever you have to do? And then later on explain why you don't touch the stove. You see, we're good with three-year-olds, but as people grow up, we forget about the compassion part, and a lot of times we just go right to the lecture part, don't we? Somebody screws up, they're sitting there bleeding, and we're like, I told you not to do that. And then we tell them all the reasons why, right? Because it's so appropriate in that moment. Do you listen first, or do you just talk? Stephen Covey, uh, author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, says, seek first to understand, then to be understood. In other words, he's saying, listen first and, and then let, share who you are later. And he stole that from the Apostle James, who in James chapter 1 said, uh, but remember this, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, because anger doesn't get it done. Are you gentle with your words? And then are your actions gentle? Do you want to lead people or do you want to intimidate people? Do you want to win relationships or do you want to win arguments? Can, can I just confess? I'm always right. <laughs> and, and you guys are always right too, right? See, we're, we're all always right, and, and the problem is that when we disagree, we want to win the argument. Can I just tell you, I have never argued anyone into the kingdom of God. Never. It's never happened. Don't think it ever will happen. And, and, I had, and God had to tell me, look, Chad, it's not about winning the, the argument, it's about winning the relationship. But that means that we have to let go of being right all the time so that we can be gentle servants of christ strength under control it doesn't mean you're admitting that you're wrong it just means that you choose the person over the moment and the argument do you want to coach people or do you want to blame people when somebody makes a mistake do you want to come alongside them and help them learn from it and correct their behavior or do you just want to go hey it's your fault you messed up do you want to know people's story or do you just want to judge people and write them off You see, our words and our actions, are they gentle? We all have power. God has given, to, given it to us, and it is more than we realize. Are you letting God control your strength? Are you helping to build God's kingdom 
with your power? Are you using your abilities and your experience? Are you using your resources and your influence to, to bless your family and to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? comes down to this now that you know what gentleness is now you know that God has given you that strength are you going to choose to submit your power to God let's pray